welcome to this video. Today I'm going to be continuing my project in which I recreate a uniform for the, women, for the World War I era Women's Land Army of America. You can learn more about that organization in my previous video which will be linked down below. For this video I'm going to be recreating the blouse that they would have worn and I'm going to be trying to use a mixture of material culture research techniques as well as original sources to, docu to create a shirt that is as documentable as possible to the period. One of my sources will be an original shirt in my collection, which it's a civilian shirt, so it's a little bit different from what they would have worn, but it's similar enough that I think it will be useful. I'll also be using an image of a shirt that's held in the Smithsonian collections and the instructions for a mannish blouse in a 1917 sewing manual titled Clothing for Women or something really generic like that. Can't really remember. <laughs> um, but let's get into it. So. The Women's Land Army of America, they were performing farm labor, so they had to wear pretty heavy-duty shirts. There was an article in the New York Times from about 1918 noting that the lingerie waists, which were a style popular blouse at the time, were not really practical for farm work. And the, re the report from the Wellesley College um, Women's Land Army training camp noted that men's blouses were actually quite useful. And then, but another report that I read from North Carolina pointed to thin white blouses as being worn. And I think this might just be a difference in like climate because it's a lot hotter in North Carolina than it is in Massachusetts. But regardless, it seems like kind of structured blouses or structured shirts with uh, not that weren't too fine were generally worn by the Women's Land Army. And a lot of the images we see are women wearing either blue or kind of tan or white blouses. It's hard to set, it's hard to tell what color they are in the black and white photographs, but you can generally tell that they're um, that they're light kind of cool colors. And I will be recreating a blouse with um, basically following the instructions for the mannish blouse in the 1917 sewing manual. Mine will have a yoke, which is a little bit different from their instructions, but is more similar to the example I found in the Smithsonian. But other than that, it will be pretty similar to the instructions in the 1917 sewing manual and to my original blouse. So with that, let's get to sewing. The original blouse I examined is a more fashionable style, gathered to a belt and trimmed with lace. As the blouse that I made was more utilitarian, I mostly focused on the basics of construction of this blouse. The shirt is stitched entirely by machine, and the stitches are about 1.5 millimeters in length. The seams, including the arm size, were stitched with narrow French seams, and the inside of the neck was bound in bias-cut self-fabric. The button placket is cut in one with the body of the shirt and folded under and stitched down, and the buttonholes are stitched vertically, without bar tacks on either side. The blouse that I made follows most of these general construction details. The 1917 sewing manual that I was using supplemented these instructions. There were a few places where the instructions in the sewing manual and the realities of my extant blouse differed. For example, the 1917 sewing manual called for the use of felled seams for the construction of the shirt, while the extant shirt used French seams. I went with French seams mainly because I did not trust my sewing machine to stitch neatly enough for a felled seam. The main places where I found the 1917 sewing manual useful were the collar and the cuffs. The mannish blouse in the sewing manual called for a turn collar which is essentially a tall rectangle, as opposed to a more shaped collar. This differed from my base pattern, but my reproduction looks quite similar to the example given in the sewing manual. I also found the sewing manual useful in the construction of the cuff plackets. The cuff placket is honestly a work of fabric origami. I had to stare at the manual's diagram for approximately 20 minutes to figure it out but the end result is not dissimilar to the cuffs on many modern blouses. This is what the finished cuff looks like if you're curious. Because my original blouse did not have cuffs, and therefore did not have buttons at the cuffs, I followed the directions in the sewing manual for stitching buttonholes with bar tacks at one edge for the cuff buttons. 
The process is not dissimilar to that of buttonholes without bar tacks. The only difference is that the bar tack is at one end of the buttonhole, and it consists of several stitches in the same direction as the buttonhole itself, anchored on a thread running perpendicular to the end of the buttonhole. As you can see, I finished the shirt and I'm pretty happy with it. I think it looks pretty similar to what a lot of the farmerettes are wearing in the extant images. I think my sleeve is too short a little bit, but that is what it is. Um, I'd really like to thank Professor Jay Watkins for being my advisor on this project, for the Charles Center at the College of William and Mary for giving me the first year Monroe Scholars Grant that allowed this project to happen, and, and to Ollie Beebe for their help in filming this video. Also, thank you to you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.